Welcome. Thank you for joining our information session to learn about the latest legal updates for businesses restructuring their workforce due to COVID-19. Uh, we are thrilled that we have attendees today from uh, all over the country, Ohio, Texas, New York, Chicago, and New England. I'm Ludivine Wolksik, I'm the Executive Director of uh, the French American Chamber of Commerce New England Chapter. Um, this event is uh, co-organized by the FACCs of Chicago and New England with the support of uh, our members. If uh, you are not familiar with uh, our activities and FACC, uh, we are nonprofit organizations with uh, almost uh, 20 uh, offices in the United States. Our main mission is uh, to uh, foster a thriving relationship, economic relationship between France and the United States. Before we start, um, I would like to share some um, uh, housekeeping items uh, with you. Uh, this webinar will be uh, recorded and the replay will be posted on the FACC's website and published on our uh, YouTube channels. Uh, as you are entering the webinar, um, you are on mute and uh, your camera is uh, turned off by default. Uh, we thank you uh, to wait for the moderator to give you the floor and stay on mute until um, you, you, you speak. If there is any technical glitch uh, during the webinar or if you are disconnected, uh, we recommend you reconnect with the same link that was shared uh, with you this morning uh, by email. The presentation uh, by Lisa Koblin uh, will last 45 minutes and will be followed by a Q&A, but we encourage you to send uh, your questions in the chat window um, during the presentation. Um, we have uh, two uh, speakers today, and they are both longtime members of uh, the French American Chamber of Commerce. Lisa Koblin uh, is a labor and employment attorney at Sol Ewing, Einstein and Lair. Uh, the company is a leading US uh, law firm with 16 offices uh, all along the East Coast and into the Midwest. It represents uh, clients with a vast array of industries in domestic and international markets, including um, many France-based companies doing business throughout the United States. Lisa is based uh, in Philadelphia. Welcome, Lisa. Hello. And our second speaker today is Myriam Le Canelier. Uh, Myriam is a co-founder and director at uh, DSML Executive executive search. Uh, our company is a US-based firm with offices in Chicago and uh, Boston with executive recruitment activity across the United States. Uh, Miriam is based in uh, Chicago. Welcome, Miriam. Thank you, Divin. And Lisa, I will turn it over to you now. Great, great. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, apparently it's May 6th now, I'm losing track of the days, but here we are. Um, I know it's been certainly a roller coaster and a fluid and constantly changing time for everyone, but we do have an information jam-packed session today, really targeted towards um, business owners, managers, and HR professionals for dealing with the latest employment-related issues um, that we're seeing specifically related to COVID-19. Um, and as mentioned in the introduction, I'm an uh, employment attorney. Our firm practices all over the country, and I spend my time doing uh, counseling managers about all sorts of employment-related issues, handling litigation matters, and working on employment agreements. Um, so that's where my background comes from, and we will just jump right into it so that we can um, get through everything today. Um, okay, so I have to give this, uh, as an attorney, I have to give you this brief disclaimer, you know, this is not uh, meant to be legal advice. Um, 
but it is going to provide certainly some guidance on best practices to consider going forward. And as mentioned, please, please feel free to type in your questions as we go. If there's a term that you're not clear on or you want to talk about more, we're happy to address it. So the focus today will be talking about furloughs, layoffs, and reduction in force, or what's known as RIFs. Um, I'm, unfortunately, I'm sure a lot of you have either faced this already, are thinking about it, may have to face it, um, or have heard about it. Um, we're going to talk about Warren Act notices um, and what that means. Some of you may be more familiar with that term than others. Certainly paid and unpaid leave for employees and how that has changed regarding COVID-19 and certain types of protected leave under new federal laws. Um, we're also going to address return to work planning, as I'm sure everyone's aware, each state is now coming out with their own plans to um, move forward and to try to get people back to work in some sort of gradual process. Um, this whole situation um, has and will be bringing about a new wave of employment law issues that we also want to touch on as well. And in addition to the questions we answer as we go, we will leave time at the end for additional questions. So depending on what stage of this process you're in, you know, unfortunately, given the economic circumstances caused by the virus, you might have to consider um, reducing your workforce in some way, whether it's temporary permanent, whether employees are just working reduced hours or they're really being let go. And you may have heard different terminology thrown out there. Um, and before you get sort of bogged down in the technical lingo, it's really important to first consider what your goals are as the employer or the manager is making the decisions, right? So you wanna think about, you know, is your goal um, to continue employment for your employees as long as possible because you have that cash flow available and maybe you even need them to continue working on a part-time basis? Are you able to continue their health benefits? Or is this a situation where you really need to, um, unfortunately, sort of cut the cord now and um, really, you know, protect your cash flow and reduce your workforce because you're just not able to function as you were? So these are the types of questions you want to figure out and think about your goals before worrying, at, worrying about what you're going to call it. Um, the other important thing to consider is what's going on, not only federally, but in the state and even the city where your employees are working and where you are based. Um, there's a lot of different laws to consider, as you can imagine, um, specifically related to payroll, to benefits, all of the unemployment, all of those categories. So it's important to keep in mind the specific location um, because there's not always a one size fits all answer depending on where your um, company is based. So you've heard these terms, furlough, layoff, and RIF, and now we're going to talk about what they actually mean. Um, so furlough, when you hear that term, what it means is you're temporarily telling somebody that they are not to work um, or not to work their regular hours, but they're still your employee. So they're still keeping their seniority, their benefits, their paid time off, but you're just limiting their work. It's usually for a finite period of time even though you don't always know exactly how long it will last, that's the general gist of furloughs. Layoffs, whether they are temporary or permanent, is really a termination of employment. Um, and this means that the employee is no longer gonna work for you, um, that they're not entitled to continuation of benefits or get their paid time off unless you've already promised it to them or unless you have employees working in a state. Um, there are a handful of states that require paid time off that employees have earned to be paid out when they leave employment. Um, and that could be whether they're fired because they did something wrong or they're laid off because the economy is not great. So again, this is why it matters where your company is based. Um, and then the third term is reduction in force. And that really means that you are making a group of layoffs. It's usually in a particular unit or a few different units where your intent is to permanently eliminate a position or a job function because you're consolidating a group of positions. So you may be facing or considering or have already rolled out one or more of these options at this time. If you have not 
um, taken these steps yet, but you're thinking about taking these steps, there's a, a number of important criteria to consider before you get to giving out those notices, letting employees know what is coming down the pipe. So the most important of these, of these considerations are thinking about what we call um, objective criteria, meaning how are you selecting the specific positions that are gonna be part of your layoff pool, your furlough pool, or who are going to be subject to a RIF. And the way you would do that is you would sort of make a chart or a list, you always wanna document employees based on job title, classification, seniority, salary, skills, anything that is not tied to a specific you know, personality trait. Um, I'm sure no one is doing this, but we obviously wanna make sure that no one is being selected based on any protected categories such as age, race, gender, things of that nature. Um, you wanna make sure that it's all tied to these documented criteria so that in the event there is an issue or concern with an employee later on, you, can, you have your sort of evidence to back up your decision. You also wanna make sure that you have more than one person reviewing this list of criteria so that you're getting input from different resources and that the person who's making the decision is not just the direct supervisor of the employees and and maybe you know last week the supervisor had a disagreement with one of them and based on that one conversation they add the employee to the list right that's not the type of decision making we want to see so it's important to have input from multiple sources to the best that you can depending of course on the size of your operation and the other really important criteria to consider here is whether your employees are what we call at will or whether they are contract employees and what I mean by the term at will is that the employee, and this is usually in an offer letter or a handbook, they're told that either the employee or the employer can terminate the relationship at any time. So this is different from a contract employee where you say to the, it's usually a higher level you know, executive um, or someone with a special skill set or maybe a doctor. Usually in those positions, you'll say um, you're going to start on May 6th and you're going to work here for two years unless you give 60 days notice and you know or all these other termination reasons right that person has a contract for employment for two years so you have to be very careful about terminating or changing um, salary or anything like that for contract employees for at-will employees where you have that discretion and you or they can end the relationship at any time you have a lot more flexibility to make the decisions that you need to make So another really important um, element of this whole equation to take into account are whether the employees um, who are going to be um, impacted, particularly by furloughs where they're still employed, whether they are exempt or non-exempt. And if you're not familiar with these terms or even if you've heard them, but you just sort of need a refresher, when we say exempt and non-exempt, we're referring to overtime compensation. So the standard in the United States, for the most part, is that employees who work um, more than 40 hours in a work week are entitled to overtime compensation for extra hours that they work over 40. If the employee is paid a salary and they perform certain job duties that the federal and state governments have determined are exempt from overtime. So somebody who's a high level executive, somebody who supervises a whole staff or is a project manager, an accountant, an attorney, there's a whole list of them. If you meet those job duties and you have a salary, then you're not entitled to overtime. And these, these categories are really important when you're adjusting schedules. Um, when you have a non-exempt employee, it's fairly simple. They do not need to be paid for hours that they do not work. So if you reduce, let's say you have a restaurant server and normally they work um, four days a week and you change their schedule to two days a week, well, they only get paid for the hours they work those two days, right? But with an exempt employee, so someone who um, is not entitled to overtime, but they're paid a salary, if you reduce their schedule, you can't necessarily just cut their salary because they're working less hours. There's very strict limitations on how you can adjust 
an exempt employee salary, um, which are governed by federal and state law. So you have to be very, very careful of that so that you maintain the exemption, meaning that you don't have to start paying this person overtime if that was not your intention. Um, so this is a little bit of a summary of what, what I was just explaining, um, but it's really important to um, consider here, and we'll get into this in more detail a little bit later, that employees, depending on their status, have access to their earned benefits versus those who are being terminated do not have access to those benefits. And then the other new highlight that's come up is the new federal sort of coronavirus leave law that went into effect April 1st, which um, definitely impacts employees in terms of protected leave, the benefits they get, how those benefits are paid, um, and so forth. Um, so we will get into those in, in a few more slides. Okay, so the WARN Act. Um, this relates to what we call mass layoffs or plant closures. You know, if you unfortunately are facing, if you're a large employer, meaning you have 100 or more employees, or if you are in New York, California, or other really progressive employee-friendly states, um, sometimes those states have laws um, where if you're smaller, let's say you only have 50 employees, this may also imply this WARN Act that's on this slide is the federal version, but some states even have their own version that are that is more strict than the federal rules. So it's important, again, to always consult with your, your local laws as well. But the gist of it is, if you're a larger size employer and you make a large um, change to your uh, staff or you're laying off a large group of people from one location or you're even shutting down an entire location, you have to give normally at least 60 days advance notice to all those employees of what's happening. Um, and there are some exceptions to that rule under the uh, federal law, which can include national emergencies. Um, and as we know, the coronavirus has been declared a national emergency, but that still means you may still have to provide the actual notice, even if you don't have to give, uh, give it 60 days in advance. And it's really important to consider this Warren Act because employers who don't give notice are hit with very severe penalties. Um, there's a daily penalty, and then you owe back pay potentially to the employees who should have received the notice who were terminated. Um, so we're, we don't we have a lot to cover. So I'm not going to go into all the many details of the Warren Act, and there are many, but definitely keep this on your radar if you're faced with making large layoffs. Okay, so another subject that I'm sure has come up for many of you, um, as you can imagine, um, layoffs are gonna impact all many different classifications of employees, including your employees who are working on some sort of um, visa status, right? So the baseline thing to remember is that for the most part, employees who are working on a, a visa are entitled to a lot of the same protections as employees who are citizens um, and they're, they're treated the same in a lot of respects. However, um, the government, just like with everything else, is releasing weekly updates about how they are modifying their policies for visa holders. Um, in certain cases, they're extending um, the length of a visa holder stay you know, the, the immigration physical offices are closed, so they're having to work remotely. So I think they're relying on the hosts or the sponsors to really check in and make sure that the visa holders are doing what they need to do. But suffice to say, um, you should definitely speak to an immigration attorney if you have specific concerns about a specific employee or employees working on a specific visa status. I use the H-1B visa as an example here because it's important to remember that um, if you were to lay off an H-1B visa holder, you would have to pay for their transportation home. Unfortunately, you can't do uh, a temporary layoff like you could do with a non-visa employee where they're sort of waiting to be brought back to work. There's strict limitations on that. It's called benching and it's not permitted. All right, so um, in case you are not aware, 
last month, effective April 1st, the federal government put a new law into effect called the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. This is different from the CARES Act you may have heard of, or which covers the PPP loans and unemployment and a lot of other aspects. This is um, a specific component of um, legislation that was passed on that was passed in March, went into effect April 1st, and it's in effect through the end of the year. And this law is very significant because it says that employees um, of covered employers have to get mandatory paid sick leave and paid family leave for certain reasons related to the coronavirus. And uh, as you'll see, notice is also required to employees. So um, I think the link here is for the DOL website, which has a, a sample poster you can provide to your employees. You can email it, or if you're, if you're in the workplace, you can actually put it up as a poster, but employees are entitled to know at this point what their rights are under this law. So I used the term before covered employers. In terms of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, this means that if you're a private sector employer with less than 500 employees, you are covered. If you are a public sector employer or a nonprofit, chances are you are covered. There's very few limitations on who is covered. There are some exemptions from covered, the term covered employers. Um, if you're a healthcare provider, um, so you're a doctor's office, a hospital, anything related to providing medical services, or if you provide emergency response services, or if you were, you know, worked for a police department or something like that, there are certain exemptions. And then there's what's called a small business exemption, which is what I have on the slide here, which relates to employers with fewer than 50 employees. If you have less than 50 employees, excuse me, you may be exempt from certain parts of this act, but not the whole act. And we'll talk about that as we go on. So this is a really big one to keep in mind. I don't know um, how many of you have been dealing with this. I get calls about this every day. Um, the reality is that a lot of people um, are at home, either they have, have uh, symptoms of the virus or a family member does, or they're caring for someone. And this is where this law comes into place. So at a very um, high level overview of the paid sick leave portion of this federal law, full-time employees who qualify for this leave um, receive up to 80 hours of paid sick time, meaning that depending on how much they earn, they can get paid up to $511 a day um, for those 80 hours of sick time needed um, that's covered by this law. So this is, this is very significant because this is leave on top of any other vacation or sick time or personal time that you already provide to an employee in your handbook. This is new and it's in addition. Um, so it, another reason why employees need to know about it and know that it's available. So there's six reasons for which employees can take this paid sick leave. Um, the first is where an employee is subject to some sort of government quarantine or isolation order. Now, this is different than these statewide stay-at-home orders that we're all pretty much functioning under. This is where the government um, or public health agency specifically comes in and says, um, let's say there's been a bad outbreak in an apartment complex that you live in. If the government were to come in and quarantine that specific apartment complex and say, forget the stay-at-home order, you, none of you can leave because the risk of exposure is so high. You are all, you all have to stay here and we will, you know, provide services to you and support you and whatever else they're going to do. That's the type of order we're talking about. Um, that is, so that is separate from the general stay-at-home orders that we're all functioning under. It's a more severe situation. The second reason that you can get the federal paid sick leave is if your doctor has told you to self quarantine because of concerns related to the virus. So this could be somebody who is has symptoms and they're trying to get tested, but there's no tests available yet. It could be somebody who has symptoms and their doctor just says, you know, regardless of test results, you need to quarantine, or it could be somebody who is actually tested positive. Um, so, and this relates to reason three, which is even just attempting to see a doctor to get tested would, the, the time the employee takes to do that would be covered by this paid sick leave. So 
So the other reasons that you can take paid sick leave um, include where you're caring for a family member um, or an individual who you know, is sick with the virus or seeking medical attention, just like if you needed it for yourself. And then the fifth one, which is the really big one that a lot of employers are struggling with, is where an employee needs time off to care for a child because school is closed or their child care is otherwise unavailable. Now, as we all know, I think for the most part, schools are closed through the end of the year. Daycares are closed except for essential workers. Most people are not inviting babysitters into their homes. So, you know, as much as a lot of people who can remote work are balancing their, you know, um, family life with their work life, this law says that if an employee says to you, um, you know, I know you're being flexible, you've relaxed my hours and you're you know, providing these accommodations, but I need to be with my kids to do homeschooling or to care for them. I cannot work today. This sick leave applies and they're entitled to it. So you have to make sure you're having these discussions with the employee. And even though you want to be generous and flexible, if they're eligible for the leave, they are entitled to it. Um, the last reason on here is sort of a catch-all category that the government added that hasn't actually been defined. So I'm not going to really spend any time on it, but they can always add another reason um, under this law if they need to. <clears throat> okay, so the second component of this federal leave law is an expansion of family medical leave. Now, for those of you who have, who have done business in the United States for some time, or if you're a larger employer, you might be familiar with what's called the FMLA, which is typically reserved for employers with 50 or more employees. And typically, if you have 50 or more employees, and those individuals can take unpaid leave for up to 12 weeks to care for a newborn, care, you know, deal with their own serious health condition, care for a family member with a serious health condition, all those kinds of reasons. And normally, the employee has to work for you for a year and have worked 1,250 hours in order to take that leave. What happened is the federal government amended that law, changed that law and said, okay, that law is fine, but we need to add a new reason for due to the coronavirus. And this is specific to childcare. And this is where it's getting really tricky for some covered employers because what this says is, if you have anyone who's worked for you for 30 days, forget the year and the 1,250 hours and, um, you no longer have to have more than 50 employees. If they've worked for you for 30 days and they need to be home with their child, they get up to 12 weeks of leave. So this is very significant. Um, and it's again, really important that you have these discussions with your employees and you try to be flexible so that you can have a healthy balance of getting what you need to get done um, and employees can do what they need to do at home. But if an employee says, I can't work because I need to care for my child, there's no child care available, this law kicks in. So this means, uh, or um, under the law, they have this um, equation where the first 10 days of those 12 weeks are technically unpaid. But what the employee can choose to do is substitute that 80 hours of paid sick leave we talked about a few minutes ago, or they can substitute any sort of paid time that they may have from you under an existing policy. So they have the option as the employee to take the first 10 days unpaid and save that sick time for another time in the year, or um, to substitute paid leave for the first 10 days or two weeks. After that, the remaining 12, uh, 10 weeks of this leave, they get paid up to $200 a day and a maximum $10,000. So for some employees who are the higher earning employees, they're gonna be incentivized probably to just try to continue to work and try to just work out their family life as they can. But for employees who are hourly or maybe who aren't making that much, you know, this is going to seem very appealing to them. And not that, you know, employees are trying to take advantage of you, but if they need to care for a child and they know that this is available, you know, you, you can expect the requests to be coming in. So if you have any questions, you know, definitely talk to your HR or talk to an attorney about how to address these inquiries. And Lisa, we have a question in the chat. Yeah. I sure. think is appropriate to the current discussion. Uh, can you mix leave for childcare and part-time work? Can you mix leave for childcare and what was the last part? 
part-time work? So um, I think what, what you're asking is what we would call, well, you have two options. You can either just, um, if an employee says to you, you know, I'm having difficulty getting work done because I need to do homeschooling with my kid for whatever the hours are, you can just agree and say, hey, you know, we're flexible. As long as you get your projects done, you do them whatever time works for you. You can always do that. And if that's fine with them and they want to keep working and getting paid their normal salary, that's fine. The other option is what we call intermittent leave. And that's where they're gonna take this leave, this family leave under the federal law, but they're gonna break it up into um, you know, a few hours a day or something of that. Now, in order to do intermittent leave, you and the employee have to agree that that's an option that you wanna provide. You're not required to provide intermittent leave, but you may wanna consider it so that you're still getting some of the work performed that you need from the employee. I hope that answers the question. I, uh, you can always type in the chat again if, you, if, if it's not clear. Yeah, I monitor for the, the chat Great. again. So thank you, Great. Lisa. Okay, so we already spoke about how this leave is in, is in addition to existing leaves. Um, I'm gonna just sort of flip through this because we have a lot to cover. Um, now, it is important to know that with the federal leave, the sick leave and the family leave, once somebody is laid off, they are not entitled to this leave anymore. So if you lay someone off because you don't have work for them or it's financial hardship, they can't come back to you and say, oh, now I would like to take family leave. Doesn't work that way. The other um, interesting fact that came out from the Department of Labor is that once you put someone on furlough status where, where you're reducing their work um, or you're telling them not to work for a period of time because there's no work available, once they're on furlough, they also don't have access to these benefits. So it's very important to clearly communicate with your employees, you know, what status they're on and what's going on with any job modifications. Okay, so now we're getting to sort of the latest current events. And um, as, ever, as we discussed and as everyone is aware, it seems like every day there's a new government order about staying at home um, and what that means. And it's critical that you are regularly reviewing these executive orders because they're often, often modifying who can work, who can travel to work, what type of work you can perform, what does social distancing mean, all of those factors. So even though the federal government is also putting out announcements about what the CDC recommends and what their return to work plans are, you have to also consult with your state government as well. Um, and it's, this is another opportunity to make sure that you're considering who is really essential to your business operations. The general consensus right now is that if you have employees who can work remotely, you should be continuing to allow them to do that, right? Nobody should be rushing to, even if, the, even if you could, you know, rushing to fill your office back up is, is probably restricted at this point. And even if it wasn't, it might not be the best practice for reasons we're gonna get into with the new employee, employee claims that we're gonna see. Um, so really think about who's essential to literally be in, in the office once your office opens, or if it's already open, you know, who really needs to be there? Um, who can work remotely? Who can do video conference calls? Are, are you continuing your bans on non-essential travel? All of those facets of this uh, pandemic and this current climate. And now is also the time when you want to start really putting together a documented return to work plan. So one thing that I've been helping clients with a lot recently is preparing sort of a memo that goes out to employees as you sort of gear up to return to work or if you're already working as you transition from maybe um, a more restricted climate to a less restricted climate. So this would say, you know, here is our general plan, depending on government orders. Here is the safety precautions that we're gonna put in place or that are already in place. Here is who you should talk to if you have any questions or concerns. And you want it to, you can put it in bullet points or however you wanna distribute it, but it should be in writing. Um, as an employment attorney, I always uh, tell clients that Unfortunately, if it's not documented, you know, the question is, did it even happen, right? Then you're left with a he said, she said scenario. So documentation and proper documentation is definitely your best friend. 
Um, not to mention that you want to make sure your employees know what's going on. And I, I think in this day and age, transparency is really helpful because obviously everybody is on high alert given the situation. Okay, so when you think about returning to work, again, whether you're working with sort of a skeleton crew right now, or everybody is remote, um, or you're closed down completely and anxious to reopen, there are a few employment related laws that you need to make sure to consider regarding screening who is coming in the door, right? So in most cases, there are state and federal laws in particular, this ADA, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act, which says in most cases you cannot take someone's temperature because it's like a medical exam. You know, you can't, when someone comes in, in your plate, in your office on most occasions, you can't give them a litany of questions about their medical history. Normally not allowed. Normally you would never do that anyway. Now that we're in a pandemic, we have to change up our safety precautions and whether it's required by the government or you want to do it because you want to make sure that there's a reduced risk of, risk of exposure in your office, there's certain precautions you're going to want to put in place. So when, because there's a pandemic and because the virus can cause what we call a direct threat to the workplace, for now you are allowed to take temperatures of employees um, provided that you know you're doing it in a safe and appropriate manner and that any records you keep of that you keep those confidential just like medical records that's okay the other thing you can do is a very limited questionnaire based on symptoms of the virus so just like if you maybe if you've tried to go to the doctor's office or you've gone places where they they may do a telephone inquiry or even in person you can ask someone you know have you had fever shortness of breath or cough within the past 14 days. Um, you can ask if they've traveled out of the country or traveled to any high risk area identified by the CDC. As long as you're keeping your questions limited and connected to CDC guidance, excuse me, and the pandemic, you're okay. What you need to be careful of though is asking broader questions where somebody could feel like you're asking about their whole medical history, right? And that's what we want to avoid. So keep your questions limited, and I recommend if you're going to do a screening to have a script that somebody follows and that's documented. So there's no question about someone asking one employee one question and another employee another set of questions. Okay, just like everything else I've talked about and my love for documentation, you want to make sure that you're, you have a social distancing plan that's written and in place. And this goes into that return to work memo that I spoke about a few moments ago. You want to make sure you have your signs posted reminding everybody about hand washing and proper hygiene and most importantly um, everybody should know that if they're sick with any symptoms of the virus or they're living with someone who has symptoms of the virus they need to not come to work and they need to report it to you so that you can make sure um, to do a risk assessment and determine whether there's been a potential exposure in the workplace okay so here's some other criteria that you uh, want to think about for your return to work plan, um, which is letting people know, you know, how are you going to ensure social distancing? Have you thought about literally reconfiguring your the desks in the office using spaces that you wouldn't normally use for day to day work, such as uh, vacant conference rooms? Um, staggering shifts or having having employees rotate between remote work and working in the office. These are all the things you want to think about now because for the most part, what the states are saying is capacities are still limited and large group meetings are still limited in addition to the six feet restrictions, right? So you have to really think about the physicality of your office, how people are moving and how they are physically going to maintain this distance in the workplace. Okay, and for those of you who have been teleworking, I do recommend sort of um, doing some soft soliciting from your employees and your managers about what has been working and maybe what could use improvement. We don't know, frankly, obviously how long this pandemic and these issues are going to continue. We don't know if we're going to go back to work only to find out that there's a second wave and we have to go back to remote work. So the more information that you can gather now, the better to prepare for 
um, what could be a more long-term teleworking scenario. As I'm sure everybody has been doing, it is important right now to be as flexible as you can with all of your existing policies. Of course, safety and security of employees is a top priority and, and you have to be careful about being too flexible in that regard. But as far as employees using their paid time off or calling, um, calling out you know, an hour before they start work if they're gonna be late or some other avenues, you, know, you definitely wanna be flexible and understanding. It's a difficult time for everyone and keeping employee morale as high as you can is, is certainly critical during this time. Okay, we are getting to the end so we can leave time for questions. Um, this uh, next as segment really covers what is gonna be coming in the future in terms of employment issues and litigation. And I, I don't think I'd be doing my job if I didn't say, here's what you should be watching out for, right? So the first um, item on our list would be failure to provide those federal paid sick and paid family leave benefits that we spoke about um, earlier. So um, if an employee was entitled to paid sick leave or paid family leave and you either didn't tell them about that option or they requested it and you denied their request for whatever reason, um, individuals are certainly going to go down the street to any attorney that they can find, which there are many, and bring a claim. Um, and if, if there was a violation, the, the government will essentially treat it as a wage and hour violation, which means you're going to be looking at paying for benefits that the employee should have had. Um, and that could be on an individual level, or it could even be on what's called a class action level, where a group of employees come together if they all have the same claims and then you have sort of a bigger problem on your hands to deal with. On a related issue are wage and hour claims. So with remote work, it's certainly, I, I know more difficult to have a read on what your employees are doing throughout the day and that's completely understandable. But for those hourly employees or non-exempt employees who are entitled to overtime, it is very critical that you're still tracking their time, whether that's a online system, an app, a sign-in sheet, um, an email, whatever system you use, you have to still track their time because they're still entitled to overtime even if they're working at home, okay? And the, the flip side of that would be if you um, had an exempt employee and you're taking deductions because you feel like they're not working a full work day, you're gonna have a problem there too. We, we covered the WARN Act briefly, but if you unfortunately had to engage in a mass layoff and you didn't issue your, those notices that I spoke about, if the layoffs last more than six months, um, you're gonna be looking at significant penalties there as well. Disability discrimination um, is another one that I think that we're going to see an increase in in the near future, specifically with accommodation claims. I know I get calls about this constantly throughout the week. It's certainly um, a hot topic right now where and whether the employee has tested positive, they just you know think that they're going to test positive. A lot of people just don't want to work because they're scared to go to work. That issue has been coming up. How are you handling those? Are you documenting um, how you're engaging with employees, are you making attempts to accommodate leave, all of those questions are going to come up and they're going to bubble to the surface. So again, make sure that you're being consistent and clear about your policies, your expectations, and what accommodations you're able to make. On a related note, unfortunately, I do also predict that there will be an increase in gender discrimination claims particularly with respect to childcare. Um, I don't think it's any secret that in a lot of families, unfortunately, women may be more um, heavily impacted with the burden of childcare than men. And so there could be situations where women need time off for childcare. And if, they're, if that request is denied or they think they're being treated differently than their male colleague, you know, that can lead to a situation um, that could result in a lawsuit. So it's important to handle those carefully as well. We also want to think about whistleblowing and safety claims. So whistleblowing, you know, if somebody thinks that they went to work and um, the state executive order says that you have to provide them with a face mask, right? New York, 
New Jersey, Pennsylvania, a lot of states are requiring employers to provide face masks now in certain settings. And if you don't do that, even on one day, even if it's because you thought you had enough and you just didn't have enough that day and you have a great reason for it and you're a great person, the employee can um, you know, call the government, call an attorney, claim that you're not following the law and these issues can kind of spiral. Um, and then finally, workers' compensation. So this is a really big one already where courts are um, not surprisingly often finding in favor of employees in terms of exposure to the virus. So even though it seems like it would be very hard to figure out if an employee actually caught the virus at work, which it is, employees are bringing these claims and they can you know, get expensive if they're not handled properly by your carrier. So make sure that your workers' comp policies are up to date and make sure that you're working with your carrier to notify them about everything you're doing to keep the work environment safe. Okay, and then lastly, um, the best way to prepare and to hopefully prevent some of these issues from bubbling to the surface is to put measures in place now to be prepared to deal with these difficult circumstances. So if you have already issued a notice to employees about furlough, layoffs, or schedule changes, and you think you maybe saw something online or on TV about a new law, review that notice. Think about, does it need to be updated? Do I have more information to share? It's always okay to issue a revised notice. What we don't wanna do is not say something because we already made an announcement, right? You wanna be current and consistent with the law. Um, you also want to be, you know, auditing and reviewing your payroll and your timekeeping records. If you are thinking back to the last few months and you realize that, unfortunately, you haven't been tracking your hourly employees' time as well as you used to, you want to check those records and you want to, you know, verify, have these employees confirmed that these hours are correct. You also want to think about um, when employees were notified about their benefits most recently? Do they know what your, your handbook says about sick leave? Do they know about the new federal law? What has been documented? Have you been consistent? Um, and, and also importantly, you know, are you training, if you're the owner or an executive level manager, have you been training your mid-level supervisors and managers to sort of issue spot these complaints, bring them to your attention, and make sure that the issues are brought to the correct person, right? So that they can be addressed appropriately. These are the, the types of considerations that you should be thinking about now to help protect you from having to deal with expensive litigation in the future. Okay, so I know that I was have, a lot. Uh, thank, I think we have thank some you. questions. I, I have already a, a, a question in, in, the, in the chat box. Great. Uh, and it's funny because it really relates to documentation. And you, this is a word that you've, you've used all along. So this one is a little specific. And I think I, I also would like to add some elements to the, sure. the topic. Um, it's, it's asking, should an employee was laid off, furloughed, or terminated sign an official letter from the employer that states the employer's decision or a conversation on Zoom or on the phone is just enough, uh, especially since the person might want to apply for unemployment. So um, without getting you know, into any um, sort of individual scenarios, I would say generally, it's important to always review whatever you're given before you sign anything. Um, you know, employers do not decide whether or not you get unemployment and most unemployment agencies are being very flexible right now in most states. So um, if somebody is laid off due to lack of work um, because the employer had to close or reduce hours, for the most part, employees are allowed to get at least partial benefits on unemployment. Um, so verifying that you've been furloughed or laid off due to the virus does not necessarily um, mean that you wouldn't get benefits. It really depends on the state that you're in and how they're handling unemployment. Um, so I would just, you know, check with your unemployment office if you have any questions, and then you can always ask, you know, your colleagues or supervisors if you have a question about the documentation um, and, and, and try to discuss any concerns you may have. But so that leads me maybe to a little bit of a, a practical uh, thing that I'd like to 
uh, add to the discussion, especially when you, you terminate employees or you lay off employees and you can't physically do it uh, the way you usually would do it in an office with an interview, exit interview, you explain. Uh, since you'd be doing this uh, virtually, uh, and don't, don't hesitate, Lisa, to correct me or to add any legal you know, perspective to what I'm saying. I'm more talking from an HR perspective. It's really important to really prepare it as much as possible uh, the day you're going to do it. Keep in mind first uh, that everyone is working from home. Right. And usually when people are laid off, you, they are not home. They actually, after being let off, they, they would go home and, and be in the comfort of their house, you know, to kind of digest the situation. Here, you're going to announce that decision to an employee while they're home. Mm -hmm. Make sure there's no distraction. Uh, plan for that meeting ahead of time. Make sure they will be in a quiet, you know, location. Um, and also make sure there's another person Right. with you when you do it as the employer who can you know uh, be part of that uh, moment provide some empathy to the moment and i would i would suggest to follow up with uh, a letter i guess uh, to 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 acknowledge the decision and also prepare for all what's around it because again you're virtually uh, you what is going to happen with the uh, computer of the person have yep. you have you thought about all these details? Are you going to uh, send someone to pick up the computer? Uh, you know, when is the effective date of the termination? Uh, a number of things you want to prepare. The person, how do you hand off, you know, projects? And all that is a little more Absolutely. tricky when you're not physically in the same space to, to, to deal with that. Absolutely. I'm looking at, I think, additional questions are coming in. Yes. So, um, Someone is asking, uh, and I'm reading the, the question, uh, I was already laid off. This is the first time I applied for unemployment. Uh, it looks like they give a very small amount of money. It looks like it's not a percentage of the salary. Uh, and they are not answering the phone because I guess all these un unemployment uh, offices are uh, overwhelmed. Um, so there is a question about, uh, is, is it capped to a certain amount? Yeah, so it, it does depend. Um, again, every state has a slightly different formula, but generally, um, depending on how long you've worked in, what unemployment does generally is there's a look back period. So when you become unemployed and you apply, they look back for a certain period to figure out what you earned during that time. So, and then they, they take a percentage of that and they cap it. Um, and that's the total benefit that you might be eligible for. In addition to that, currently the federal government is providing additional unemployment benefits in a lot of cases. So again, I can't speak to any specifics and it does depend on what state you're in and how long you've been working. Um, and I don't know if there's gonna be multiple checks issued depending on if it's a, a federal uh, benefit or a state benefit. Um, but, and I know every unemployment office is, is inundated. All I can say is I would try to you know, email, call, um, do it online chat, whatever you can do to get in touch with them um, to verify the amount. But unfortunately, in, in the U.S., you, you never get the full uh, salary that you were earning before you were unemployed. And there's another question. Uh, what about the additional $600 per week that laid off employees can get until the end of July? Do all laid off uh, employees qualify for that, even part-time employees? Uh, or does it depend on their previous wages? So for the most part, my understanding is that if you qualify for unemployment, you will get the extra $600 for the period that's, that it's in place. I can't speak to how the checks are issued or how long it takes for that $600 to be approved. But my understanding is if you're eligible for an amount of unemployment, you will get that extra $600 at some point. Uh, so there's another question and I think I can partly answer and then you probably can answer from the legal uh, perspective. In this crisis, how do you get your materials back from a laid off employee, a laptop, phone, et cetera? Are you supposed to ask your former employee to come to the office and bring your company's materials back? 
Uh, so at least from an HR perspective, I would say you should make it as easy as possible. It really depends, I guess you have to, uh, if the employee is another, in another state, uh, you know, really far from you and no one from the company can come and pick up the materials, then you probably have to uh, organize a way where they would ship anything back to you and you pay for that shipping. It should be paid, I think, for the employer should pay for that. But right. Lisa, Absolutely. what is your take yeah. on that? Yeah, so obviously it's very complicated given not only the remote working, but everybody wants to social distance, right? So the safest and easiest thing, honestly, probably depending on how much materials we're talking about would be to um, have the employee put it in the mail, reimburse the employee for whatever the shipping was, um, or if they've gone to the post office and they can give you, you know, an exact amount, um, you can always um, issue that ahead of time so they can send the materials back. Another option would be to meet um, in either the lo a lobby or, um, you know, in front of a Starbucks and literally the employee gets out of their car, puts the box on the ground, then you get out of your car. I mean, it, again, it really depends on the logistics of where they are, where you are. Um, I completely agree that the whatever is easiest for you works. Um, certainly though, you wanna keep your, your distance. And if the employee, um, you don't really wanna make someone feel like they're forced to come be in some sort of closed environment. Um, but if for some reason they're concerned about going to the post office and they're willing to meet you at a park, you know, as long as you get your stuff back, it doesn't matter. But you really wanna make sure you're documenting that you are requesting these materials and why you need them back. Whether it's confidential, it's company property, um, and and it's certainly if they're valuable items like a computer or something of that nature, you always want to follow up in writing. And by the way, I would add also that's part of the preparation I was mentioning earlier that you need to have anticipated with your IT, you know, what time exactly or what day the person is going to be disconnected from work email, uh, access to, you know, shared documents or documents. And Absolutely. this is something that you need to anticipate. You can't just... Uh, be at the time you're discussing the layoff with the person and start to scratch your head and oh man, I didn't think about it, so. Right. Uh, so, so obviously people are asking if you're going to share your slides because it's a very good presentation and the answer is yes. Uh, the FACC will uh, send uh, the presentation and there's a recording in fact of that webinar that will be available uh, shortly. You'll receive an email from uh, the FACC. Um, yes. So I'm just uh, looking at the chat to see if there's any other thing um, coming. You covered so much, so I guess. <laughs> yes, I know. We don't I have know so many questions. Lot, um, there's a lot going on, but hopefully everybody got a taste of the highlights and um, found it useful for their, their own practice. Another uh, detail that, uh, you know, stories I've heard myself uh, uh, when you, again, lay off employee, depending on their roles, uh, you have to make sure what type of uh, commitment they had, any, any upcoming meetings they were part of, maybe, you know, a client meeting was organized, even if it's virtual, you know, these, these look silly, but you need to anticipate those things and, again, make sure you discuss them the day, the last day or the the time leading to the uh, separation with the employee. Absolutely. Um, there's another question here, sorry. What protections are available to employees of smaller companies not obligated to offer paid sick time FMLA or time for childcare in the current situation? So um, again, you know, a lot of these questions, it really does depend on where you're working, um, what state or city that you're in. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, there are certain federal benefits, the, the federal paid sick leave and federal paid family leave that de depending on your employer, what you do, what they do, you know, whether they're exempt um, and their size, um, even small employers um, will be providing some of certain of those benefits to their employees. Um, so I always recommend um, if somebody has a question to, you know, ask their HR, their manager, if they have any questions um, because they think they need leave for a particular reason. There's 
one question about more of the returning back to work and uh, mm -hmm. all the um, piece of advice you shared. Uh, so what if, you know, as an employer, uh, everything is done as, as much as possible to, to prepare the office, social distancing and stuff like that. But if the office is located in a major uh, city where people come to work using public transportation, yeah. is there any liability here for the employer uh, since the person might actually get, you know, infected using transportation, not so much being infected in the office? Right, right. That's a great question. And of course, uh, something on everyone's mind. I mean, I, I work in a city every day. And um, I, I do believe that, um, as far as I know, most public transportation are increasing their cleaning measures and sanitation. But um, I have to imagine that's one of the <laughs> worst places to be right now is stuck on a subway. Um, typically, though, um, sort of like with, um, well, there, there's a couple things. So in general, an employer would be responsible for what happens on its own premises in the office or at a function sponsored by the employer. So if somebody slips and falls in the office because the floor was wet or the employer hosts a fundraiser and um, the employee, you know, um, gets hit in the face with something, I don't know, the employer would, um, make sure the employee got care and that you would file a workers' compensation claim to take care of that situation. With the virus, it, it sort of works the same way. Um, the only caveat being this is where you have to be really careful about your travel policies. And right now, for the most part, um, I, I think most places are really limiting travel and you wanna be very cautious about not just your daily commute, I'm not talking about that, but if you were to send an employee on a business trip and they're traveling because of work, which is treated a little bit different than your regular commute, right? Your regular commute, um, that time that you go to your office every single day, that's not really work time. But if you are traveling because you're a salesperson or um, some other position where you have to go on a business trip and the employer sends you to a specific conference or location once those are up and running, if you did get sick or if an employee did get sick um, in that environment, there could be a worker's comp um, issue there as well. So, you know, this is why just like with social distancing and teleworking, you want to limit travel to the extent possible until the CDC and the government really determines that it's safe to, you know, go back to normal. Which might take some time. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, I think I don't see any more questions, okay. so I don't know. All right. Well, um, Thanks everybody for joining us today. I'm glad that we were able to do this and um, our uh, contact information is up on the screen. If anyone has any other questions, I'm happy to talk um, after the presentation. You can email me um, or call um, with any other questions and I'm sure. Thank you, thank you Liz. And on behalf of the FACC of Chicago, thank you both very much. This was an extremely um, helpful, presentation full of very pertinent, very timely information. So thank you. Thank you very much to both of you for taking the time to, to be here today. Happy, happy to be here. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> you did <laughs> most of it. <laughs>